Okay, hello everybody. My name is Andy Cotgreave. I'm technical evangelist here at Tableau, and it is fantastic to be coming from the conference uh, here with Cole Naflick. Hi, Cole. How Hi, are you? Andy. I'm doing fantastic. Very Thank good. You. Could you uh, introduce yourself to the people watching? Absolutely. So I am Cole Nussbaumer Naflick. I'm CEO at Storytelling with Data, where we focus on helping individuals and organizations make graphs that make sense and weave them into compelling and action-inspiring stories. All right, that's fantastic. Let's start off with it. Make graphs make sense. Yes. That sounds so easy, but I think you found over many years it is not, right? Well, it is and it isn't. I uh -huh. think it, there are simple things that everyone can do to make their graphs more effective. And that's what we try to focus on. It's just a really practical, right? What can I apply today or tomorrow yep. when it comes to choosing a graph that's going to work for what you want to get across? Uh, identifying and removing clutter, focusing attention, telling a story, really thinking about our audience through all of this. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think we'll, we'll, we're going to cover all of these things in the next 30 minutes. Um, first, all of it in the next 30 minutes? <laughs> all right, maybe that's ambitious. Okay, we're, knowing how in our previous conversations, we probably get, maybe we'll cover one of, just one of those, but we'll see how far we get. Um, First of all, how did you get to here? Because you're you, you're an author of one book. You've just got another book coming out or come out, right? So yeah, two, out, books. two books. But you've got a pretty good background uh, from this. Can you explain a little bit about the background? Yeah, sure thing. So I studied math in school, but always really found it fascinating the space where you can take numbers and do something meaningful with them in terms of helping someone understand something new or better and drive them to take smarter actions. So when I entered the business world, I started off in banking and credit risk management, you know, building statistical models. And for me, the data viz piece started as the way to invoke some creativity into the yeah. process, right? Playing with colors and graphical forms and those sorts of things. And what I started to see was when I paid more attention to the visual design of the data, people paid more attention to my data. Yeah. And so it was this self-reinforcing thing. So I went from banking to Google in an analytical role in the HR organization, human resources, right? Not an area that you commonly see a ton of data, but yep. more and more today. Uh, but I joined the people analytics team there when it had just formed, so it was tiny, so I got exposed to a lot of different things. And still really found that space fascinating where we can take data and make it visual and help people do new things with it. Yeah. And so I got the opportunity while I was at Google, because people sort of said, hey, you know, you sort of, you like this, and you're sort of good at it, why don't you build some training for a program that we're doing and help teach more people how to do this? And so I developed a course that we taught at Google. Uh, there was a lot of interest in it, so we ended up rolling it out across the company, which was fantastic. I got to travel around the world yeah. and teach people uh, what I'd been learning about best practices, right? The, some of the things that I'd sort of stumbled on through trial and error over time, but this was when I encountered Tufty's books, Stephen Few's books, and started to recognize that there are easy things that we can teach that people can use to be better when they communicate yeah, with data. Absolutely. And it was when I started recognizing that, okay, if, if I'm having engineers and salespeople, right, t totally different types and, and many others show up at these classes, this isn't a thing that's unique to a certain role or company or industry. These are things that anyone can learn to improve their day-to-day -day work life. So uh, it's been almost a decade ago Is it that really? I left Google and have been doing this. Yeah. Right? So teaching others what I've learned and what we're all learning yeah. about being better at yeah. this. So let's let, let's come on to your talk, but you're, you're here at uh, Tableau Conference for the second time. Second time, right? although the last, it doesn't feel like I've been here twice because right. it's a very different experience. Yeah. My last conference, I think we figured out, was 2010. Yes. Uh, so it was in Seattle. It was a couple hundred people. I think so, I think. yeah. I mean, even our smallest breakout session room this year is probably five or 800 people. Yeah. Right? It, so then you were sitting among a group of like 20 people yeah. in a breakout. Yeah. Uh, Gar Reynolds and Stephen Few were the keynotes. Yeah. And it was fantastic, but it was a very different experience yeah. from the uh, size so and how intensity. Have, yeah, here. how have things changed? Can you 
try and capture something of what it's like for those who aren't? You know, here? I think for me, the, my most interesting moment so far has been I went to the devs on stage mm -hmm. this morning, which it drew a lot of people, right? So I was in the arena that, that must see thousands, I don't know, 10,000 It's 8,000 people, 8, people, I believe. 8,000 people. Be, yeah. And so I entered at the top, right, where you walk all down the stadium seating, and then there's seats on the floor, and so I could still see some seats on the floor. My yeah. husband's here with me, so we're walking down, take some seats on the floor. So the stage is right there, but looking around at the audience of that many people in awe of the engineers and the product managers who are on stage showing graphs and walking through new yeah. features and people were cheering and it just, it blows my mind in such a fantastic way. It, uh, this is my 10th US conference, yeah. it still blows my mind, you know, the, the passion of these. And uh, actually, what did you think of the, about the design of the charts in Devs on Stage? You know, I tweeted one. It was when uh, Filippos was up, uh, the product manager, and yeah. he was showing it was the revenue by type of music, uh, you know, total revenue over a long time period on the left, and then he kept uh, deselecting things that brought it uh, closer to current date on the right. Yeah. And then you see the slope graph that connects the two that's basically showing the change in rank, right, between yeah. the two. Yeah. And it was simple, and it was beautiful. I, yeah, I, I, I was sort of blown away. I was like, literally, every one of these charts seems to be designed so well for presenting in, on a really big screen. Um, and that, that, that kind of getting design right is a lot of what you've been trying to do over the last decade, right? So, sure. And your talk is low-tech superpowers for data storytelling, yeah. right? So can you tell us a little bit about the session so you did? I wondered if it would be a little risky coming into a conference that is all about a tool, or mostly about a tool, and starting with the premise of the tool doesn't answer it for us, right? Because really the whole point of the talk was to encourage people to step back and really think, think throughout the process uh, about who their audience is, about what they're designing for, right? What me need are they trying to meet? Yeah. How can we use low-tech things? And I use in the talk, I use the inspiration of my kids, right? I go through this scenario where my oldest has some homework and there's chaos, and so I organize the chaos by making them each superheroes who can combine yeah. powers and help with the homework, and then recognize that I can use the same powers they used there on my data. And what are those powers? So the powers were, let's see, Avery was a super writer. Yep. So he recognized the how you can use words to refine pictures and pictures to refine words in this recursive fashion where they can both make each other stronger and both get stronger. Uh, also the power of sketching for being able to quickly iterate through different views, uh, not forming attachment to what we've done, right? It's easy to rip it up and start over when yeah. you're on pen and paper. And then Eloise was our curious cat. She asked the question, why, 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 over and over again. And it's this reminder that when we're working with data, it's easy to stop at sort of the super, superficial uh, point. But when we can repeatedly ask ourselves and those around us why, we can get at a better understanding of our yeah. data, we can understand what assumptions we may be making that we're not aware yeah. of, and we can eventually use the, our better understanding to create a more robust picture for our audience. And then Dorian was narrative ninja. Dorian taught us the power of structure, right? Planning up front. We talked about storyboarding and using post-it notes and going through this process of brainstorming and then editing and then seeking feedback and iterating with that, uh, which gets you the structure, but yeah. it doesn't yet get you story. No. So no. then we talked about the narrative arc and how you can reimagine. And I, I went through a, an example through all of this where you know, we, see, we see it getting storyboarded, we see it through the arc, and the whole point of all of it was you should do most of this before you do much in your yep. tool. Because when you do that, then you can go through this sort of stellar presentation of your data. That's, it's, oh my gosh, Cole, how are we going to go from here? Right, so the, the, the attachment from pen and paper and sketching, I, I think, I, I mean, it's, you know, the power of the pen is amazing, right? And the attachment piece is really interesting. Now I know, I know there are some people in our community who think, well, you can sketch with Tableau because you can just drag and drop no, and use it as an as you do something, So for me, as soon as I do something in a tool, you, like you form this attachment, right? Whether you mean to or not. Mm -hmm. Because if I have this idea for a crazy chart type and I spend time perfecting it or even not perfecting it, right? Yeah. I spend enough time monkeying with things to get it to work. Yeah. 
I now want it to work, even if it doesn't, and I may fight against but the how, fact that but it doesn't. The pushback is, if if I'm sketching on a piece of pen and paper, I'm going to sketch the perfect picture with the perfect distribution no, of data. No, you don't have to. You, and, no? and it can be rough, and, it, and by being rough, it means sometimes it still won't work when you get yeah. to your tool. But I can sketch the same crazy graph that would have taken me hours to build yeah. in five minutes time yeah. uh -huh. or less, right? And decide either, yes, that's worth pursuing or eh, maybe not. And if I get somebody else's feedback at that point, yeah. that can tell me, and that was a big part of it too, is when we when we storyboard and we use paper up front and these low tech fast things, I can go to my cl client or my stakeholder and say, hey, this is rough, yeah. but directionally are we aligned here? Yeah. And they can either say, yeah, I think so, proceed, yeah. or no, let's go back to the drawing board, yeah. and now I've not invested, it's got screaming happening in the background, yeah. a ton of time and attention. <laughs> it was a really good point I just made, right? Yeah. To, um, I just totally lost my train of thought. I, I know. Oh, to if get you, that if feedback, you can't right? hear what's going hear. on here, what we can hear is about Wild cheering in the background. Members yeah. All cheering while a big photograph is taken. <laughs> uh, all right, well, so the other path from there is you've described, you know, the curious cat, the narrative ninja, the all, all those different uh, aspects, and you also, kids. yeah, and and you, you're fantastic children, right? And <laughs> but you also talked about it not being the tool, that you know things should, you shouldn't focus on the tool, and there's there's something there about. Well, you have culture. to focus on the tool at some point. No, at some point, but more I'm like how, uh, you know, you know, in your second book, you've got sections on data culture and how yes. to be successful, right? And I, I just, do you think should individuals try to be all those people, or is this a team structure? Uh, base. I mean, for sure, everything's better in a team, right? Because it means you have multiple brains and mm -hmm. multiple viewpoints to be able, and people naturally come at things from different yeah. angles. So there's, al there's almost always benefit from getting feedback and having other people around you to yeah. you know, help you play devil's advocate yeah. or understand assumptions you're making that may or not play out yeah. and those sorts of things. Uh, and it's an interesting question, right? One of the questions I am posed frequently is, well, does it make sense that one person can do this whole spectrum, or should you have different people who, right, it's one person who does the analysis, it's another yeah. person who does the visualization, it's maybe a different person who communicates it. And I have a negative visceral reaction to that because I think you can too easily end up in a throw it over the fence yeah. sort of mentality, and then nobody has the depth of understanding of, of across to make it work, which can be dangerous. Yeah, there's a, I don't know if you, there's a concept in coding called pair, pair, pair programming, where you literally share the same keyboard and screen, and two people are writing. You're writing code together, oh. right? And um, you know, one person might be giggling. Oh, that would API. drive me mad. Uh, when I, oh, well, I used to be a software engineer, and when I, the first concept, I was like, well, this is crazy. But yeah. the thing, the thing that was really powerful about it is that one person is self-checking some of the problems along the way, and you know, that you, you're just, you might be the one writing the code in the moment, but you're just getting little nudges about you know why are you doing that or you could do that more efficiently uh, and, and it's a really interesting concept but I thought well would that work in data visualization if I was you know I that? always thought that the visualization analysis in general especially on the exploratory analysis side if apprenticeship were still a common thing like this would be the perfect space for apprenticeship mm -hmm. right where a newbie fresh out of school sits with somebody who has been exploring and analyzing and visualizing data and can pepper them with questions and yeah. watch to see because yeah. there there is a science to it but there's such an art to all of it as well yeah and, you know knowing which path to go down and how far to go and when to rein it back in and where to focus I, is, so it's a science and an art is it yeah. equally N uh, no, it, like if we picture the Venn diagram, right, of part science, part art, I think where you are and who you're designing for yeah. dictates where you are in that or how much overlap yeah. there needs to be. All right. Because right? you visualize data for different things. I focus mainly on when you're visualizing in a business setting. And so then efficiency of information transfer is, mm -hmm. right, make it easy to get yeah. the information across yeah. is the thing that we uh, prioritize above other things. Yeah. But that's not the only reason to visualize data. There are lots right. of reasons to yeah. visualize data. It's so let's m maybe go back a little bit to basics because we talked about you, you know the, the process to make it to make the thing. Yeah. What is the thing that you are you are trying to help people build, right? I wrote the big book of dashboards. You wrote storytelling with data. Uh, are we talking about the same things when in our different books? 
Uh, what are you, when you're talking about stories, what kind of outputs? I think if I step back and think of our meta goal, it's to help inspire positive change through data mm -hmm. and through the way that we communicate with data and visualize it and help other people understand yeah. it. And so, yeah, I think there's certainly alignment between what I've written about, what you guys have written about, the big book of dashboards. It's those are both pieces of yeah. that. But I think the bigger picture for me is it's bigger. Too. Yeah, all right. And um, now a lot of Tableau customers will be building business dashboards yes. for, for their organization. Um, do you think dashboards should tell stories? It's interesting because you and I did a podcast this morning and this was one question that I had on my list that we didn't get didn't to. Get, so now we get the chance. We get the chance. Uh, I do not believe that a dashboard is the place to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And it probably comes back to what I think of when I think of dashboard. Because for me, a dashboard is a collection of graphs in a small space where you can look through quickly to see where are things in line with my expectations, where are they not in line with my expectations. Dashboards for me make the exploration of, or should make the exploration of data faster. Yeah so that we can identify potentially interesting things faster. And we use the dashboard to identify those interesting things, then we dig into that, right? More than probably we would get in the how the dashboard yep. is as, as it stands. We dig into that, we get to understand it, and then if there's something interesting there, that's for me when we step out of dashboard land and we do everything that I talk about in my books when it comes to uh, you know, focusing attention where you want it, highlighting specific takeaways, and bringing your audience on a journey yeah. with you. Yeah, I, I, I love that. You know, I, I, I work for Tableau. We have this massive analytical platform, right? The, almost the entire stack. And sometimes I feel like we forget that's like, well, okay, that enables you to find things. Yes. But then you have to go and actually persuade someone, or tell your boss something, or inspire your team, or yep. talk to a customer, right? Or, or change the world. And you know, I always fear that we sometimes forget that, and that's where some of your your uh, stuff comes in. So, um, so if a dashboard isn't telling a story, but we're going to share the insight, how? You know, I've got a dashboard with a bunch of graphs. Now I need to go and communicate my insight. Yeah. What? What do I need to do first? How do I take a dashboard, inf some information on a dashboard, and then transform it? What are some of the maybe? Yeah. First things For me, the about. first thing you come back to is you come back to your context of it, right? Who's your audience? How are you communicating to them? Are you there to talk them through this, or is it something that's being sent off that has to mm -hmm. be consumed on its own? There are different design decisions yeah. that go into those things, particularly around level of detail that has to be there. Uh, more detail in the thing that you're sending around if you're not there. Uh, and it's thinking about how you can, you know, how you can use the tools you have to get the thing you need to happen to happen. So a basic part of that is you have to first identify what it is you want to yeah. happen. And it's not always so straightforward as we found X, therefore you should do Y. Right? Yeah. Often it's more nuanced than that. Or we may need input from our audience or stakeholders to be able to even yeah. get to a recommendation. Uh, and for me, the bigger thing that I encourage people to think about is for every scenario, particularly if it's high stakes, think about all of these things. Think about who your audience is, how you're communicating to them, what you need them to do. Are they, do you expect they will be with you and supportive of that, or are you gonna have to fight against them? What biases do they come in with? And for me, the trap I see people fall into too often is we just communicate with our data the way we've always communicated with it because we always do it that way, right? It's the same monthly report yep. it's been for 10 years because that's the one people expect. Yep. But if there's something really interesting happening on page 86 of the monthly report or the recurring dashboard that needs attention, it's yep. not going to get it that way. Yeah, and uh, the first chapter in your new book is about the big idea, right? That this is what you're talking Context, about. Context, audience, yeah. planning. So I, I, I got a copy of your book and used it. I was trying to solve a problem, and I used, yeah. that, I used that model that day, and it was like, ah, that brings clarity to what I'm trying to, in this case, trying to get my manager to Agree something. It's like okay, thinking that and through so really simple, helps. Right, and it's the, and we teach the big idea in almost every workshop we do, which mm -hmm. is basically who's your audience, what do they care about, right? Yeah. What's at stake, and how can you put that all together in a way that's going to make sense not only to you but to somebody else? Yeah, and it really, really takes. As I'm sure you saw, a couple minutes thinking about yeah. that, and you as a result of spending that couple minutes are already better poised to do something that's going to be successful. Yeah, and I, I do think, and, and uh, you know, while we're talking about, okay, taking the insight and communicating that to create the change and share the insight, I think that big idea approach, you know, as I reflected on it, well, it, it applies to those building dashboards as well, right? You are thinking, 
He was my audience. Harder there, right? Because then you have to mm. think ahead to what stories are my audience yeah. going to want to try yeah. to find and tell right. with this, and how do I then design yeah. for that? Yeah, because then you, it's, it's like, okay, I'm going to list the top 10 things in this category, right? It's, well, why? Why, why? why do they care about seeing that? Is it if one is bigger than the other, if what, or if the proportion of things are equal? And if you don't sit down and do this kind of big idea of the dashboard, you are going to set yourself up to fail because it'll just be vanilla with no real uh, call to action. So I, I just love that concept, and you know, I, it'd be really great to. See, see that applied in a dashboard. Well, and this is one thing that's been really interesting to me over time, is when I think of our workshops, people come in thinking they want data visualization, primarily. <coughs> uh, and we're finding that people are walking away with what feels like more and more value, and we're having more in-depth and robust conversations about a lot of the things that have to do with communicating in general yeah. that actually have nothing to do with the data, right? And it's it's planning, and that's back to these low-tech things, storyboarding, yeah. right? Filling out a worksheet, <coughs> being thoughtful about how we communicate. Yeah. So what? Why? Why is? Why are these skills not? I think it's because across the there's workforce. been such a push for technical skills, mm -hmm. particularly in the past decade or two, right? We we have more data now than we've ever had mm -hmm. before, and increasingly everybody is being asked to do things with data, even yeah. roles that traditionally wouldn't have had to yeah. touch data. And so there's been such a focus on the technical side that some of these other skills have been sort of undervalued. I, it frustrate, I mean, it, I, you know, I'm from the UK, and uh, again, we've had the massive investigation in, investment in STEM subjects, and that's great, but but now we're seeing the arts yeah. funding as well. Right, the data cool, scientist right? can't yeah. do well yeah. if they can't articulate what I they've know. done and communicate yeah. that fantastic and work to someone else. Every conversation I've had in the in these chairs today, we're talking about this balance of science and arts, right? You can't, you can be a scientist, but you've got to be able to communicate, and that's... And what gets me is when, and I see this more often from folks who come up through the technical background, where the, they hear a story or terms like that and think that, oh, no, that's I don't need to worry about that. That's fluffy mm. marketing mm. stuff. And for me, that means people aren't thinking about it strategically because no. you can actually be very pointed in how you use concepts of storytelling <laughs> is, that will help you get your point so, across so and your this, message heard and get people to yeah. do things that you want them to do. So I can see you're getting agitated. This gets me agitated too, right? And uh, you know, this has driven me for the last few years. And uh, Alberto Cairo, who's just got uh, How Charts Lie, came out, which is an amazing book. Uh, he's, he sent a tweet, put a tweet out about 18 months ago, and it was like, if you are an analyst who thinks that the cliche uh, the, the soft skills is uh, no hang on if you if you think that uh, communication and design is just a soft skill then you clearly don't understand what that job is yes. right and I was just like it, he just nailed it perfectly because you know I just I, it just really frustrates me that that is underappreciated but I think that's <sighs> changing. That, yeah. that is changing. There's recognition that technical skills are important, mm -hmm. but that actually those technical skills almost don't matter when somebody can't do yeah. the communication. Yeah. Right? I am a huge believer there's a ton of value to be obtained by work that's already being done that just isn't being yeah. communicated as effectively yeah. as it could be. There's a, have you heard of a book called The Fuzzy and the Techie by no, Scott Hartley? I don't know this one. So that's great. That's a really good book. Just he, he's got loads of amazing case studies about examples where, well, the scientists did their thing, but then they stumbled because they had nobody from the liberal arts yep. background. And one great example was uh, in the world of driverless cars, you know, that they create incredible technology, but then they realized the human interface between a driverless car and the human beings actually required somebody with a lot of liberal arts background and anthropologists, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, so I think in a world of AI and ML, it's really important, but even in this storytelling paradigm, absolutely uh, paramount too. Um, so you talked about uh, story. Um, what is the key ingredient to an effective story within data? Because I mean, it's, it's a such a big concept. Right? Yeah, it's hard to nail down one key ingredient, I think, because different scenarios are going to call for different things. I think if I had to narrow it down to one, the one thing would be tension. And tension, tension. Mm -hmm. because story, right? When I think of story, I think of this narrative arc where you start off, there's a plot. Tension is introduced, that tension builds in the form of a rising action, yep. there's a falling action, a resolution. And to have that shape of an arc, you have to have tension. 
And this is one thing that I think we overlook frequently when we're communicating with data. Mm -hmm. It's very easy and it's typical to follow a linear path. Right, we start off with our question. What did we set out to solve for in the first place? Then our analysis. What are the statistical methodologies we employed? Then our findings, then the recommendation. And at no point in that linear process do we really have to think about our audience. And for me, when we rethink things along the arc, yeah. we have to identify the tension. It's not about making up tension. Yeah. If there weren't tension, we'd have nothing to communicate about in the first place. And it's not the tension that matters to us, it's yeah. the tension that matters to our audience. Because if we can figure that out and frame our story around that, then our resolution becomes, what does our audience need to do to resolve the tension we've brought to life? So how, how can you identify the tension that your audience will respond to? It, getting to know your audience, right? Thinking mm -hmm. about what matters to them. There's some sort of bullet point mapping you can do to try to say things like, you know, what is my audience motivated by? Are they motivated by making money or beating the competition or doing good in the world or recognition, right? Yeah. A whole host of influential sort of things. Uh, and then what do you need your audience to do, right? And how do you bring those two together in a way that enables you to get your audience's attention and build credibility yeah. for what you need and ultimately motivate them to act. You know what? What's there's, there's just thoughts crystallizing in my head, right? <laughs> I sit through a lot of monthly meetings in Tableau, and sure. we show a lot of Tableau in our Tableau meetings. And in some meetings, it's the same chart every single month. Yep. And so you, I just zone out because it's like, well, maybe the numbers have changed, so but essentially I'm seeing the same thing. If there's no story there, don't yeah, make a story. Right. Uh, but then <laughs> our VP in EMEA is James Eilawart, and his meetings are incredible because every time, every he brings a different chart every single month to tell a story about the data. So it's yep. never the same. Yep. But he also knows that if I'm going to, if he's going to introduce a new chart every month, you can't just show the chart and assume people will yeah. understand it. So he he does the, you know, he always kind of does the Hans Rosling yeah. mastery in that yeah. this is a complicated chart. I'm going to tell you what this the, the an individual dot means. Yes. Going to explain the axis. And now, I'm, and, and then he's bringing and he's bringing the tension in because, yep. you know, this is sales sales values that all the salespeople kind of care about. You know, that's this opportunity. This is where it went, and so it takes time. It takes a lot of effort. Yep. But and we're all captivated. When it's done well, you can't yeah. not it's, pay it's, attention. Honestly, it's, he, and so that is a skill, and that is a skill that takes practice. But it's a skill that anyone mm. can learn, and so. Anyone who works with data, who has to present data, needs to get comfortable explaining that and talking through it. Yeah. And it's funny because I think we jump straight to uh, sort of the nitty gritty and don't back off and say things like, hey, here's this graph. Here's what's shown on the y-axis. Yeah. Here's how you interpret yeah. it. Here's the minimum, here's the maximum. Here's what we're looking at on our x-axis. And one great way to do that is to start describing graphs when they're not there in front of you or if uh, if so your audience doesn't see them. Literally, so on is, a word, that's this interesting. This is interesting for me is that we started doing a podcast about two years ago, yeah. Storytelling with Data podcast. Mm -hmm. And at first, my, it, this was my husband's idea, and at first I was sort of like, really a podcast about data visualization, communication? That seems strange. He's like, no, no, people learn this way. And it's been fascinating for me in the way, wait, on a number of fronts, but one hand, in the way that it makes me think about both how I design graphs and then how I talk about them. And then, it, retroactively, how I should design them given that I have to talk about them, right? Because if you can paint a picture of what a graph looks like, right? Imagine a line that's increasing upwards and to the right. The line depicts sales. Then there's a sharp drop. The sharp drop, if you can do that without the graph even there, then when you've got the graph there as well, that you know, is magic. You know what would be a great exercise? To pair up with people and sort of try, one person describe it and the other try and draw it. Yeah. And then see... You know, well, and see imagine the, the, the tension that would then happen as yeah. a result of the oral and physical yeah. and yeah, I'm I'm fascinated in how we learn and how our brains work about this stuff uh -huh. and uh, yeah, and the simple things that we can do to make life easier for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> and oh, to do more with our data. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Well, we only have about a minute and a half. Do you know what left. we haven't talked about yet? Is I the new book. Well, I, I, we've got a minute and a half to go, so I, I thought I'd give us a buffer for the new book. So, 
Yes. You have a new book out. I what have a new book out. The new book just came out last month. The book is mm -hmm. called Storytelling with Data, Let's Practice. Mm -hmm. And it's a different sort of experience. This isn't a book that you sit down and read. Uh, it's organized by the same lessons as the original book, Storytelling with Data. Uh, but this one's broken into exercises. So each chapter is organized in three sections of exercises. There's Practice with Cole, where I pose a scenario or an exercise that you're meant to solve on your own, but then I also go through my solution as a way of introducing a ton more content and examples and just insight into the behind the scenes thought yeah. process. Then there's practice on your own, which is similar sorts of exercises, but without any prescribed solutions. So this is great for university instructors, for example, who are teaching or managers who want to upskill their team. And then the final exercise section within each chapter is practice at work. So this is, okay, you've done this in theory, right? Now let's take a project you're facing in your day-to-day -day and let's break it in the component pieces. And you know, when do you need to get feedback? Who should you get feedback from? What do you do when you encounter challenges? And yeah. how do you really think through this in a tangible way with something that you're dealing with in your day-to-day? -day? So it asks you to do some work, to do some thinking, but there's a ton of what I hope is good stuff there for helping people yeah. not just absorb, but really apply the sorts of lessons that we've been teaching. Well, the book's fantastic as well. Yeah. And, and I think also um, you do monthly challenges. Can we you do. just explain those? Because I yes. think they're amazing too, right? So the monthly challenge is something that we've been doing for the past couple of years. And it's meant to be a low risk space where people can participate and try something new. And so each month will feature a different graph type or a different topic. And what's even more exciting for me than the challenge is that we've just rolled the challenge into our new storytelling with data community which is an online community where people can go to help hone their skills. So I'm a strong believer to get good in this space that you need to practice and get and give feedback and discover great work and talk to other people who are facing similar challenges or may have successes that you can learn from. And the Storytelling with Data community has been crafted to facilitate all of these things. Yeah. And so we're in beta testing mode right now. We've rolled the, ch the monthly challenge into it. There are also some exercises along the same same sort of lines as what folks will find in the practice book. And I'm very excited. This will yeah. be a resource that I hope we can use to help people everywhere further hone how they yeah. communicate with data. Well, I, I think the challenges are great. It's really good seeing what people do every month. So uh, we can wrap up by saying, where can they go to find out more? Storytellingwithdata.com. It's easy. Uh, it's easy. Uh, you can also follow on Twitter at StoryWithData. And yeah, I hope people will check out the book, check out the community, yeah. and that we can all learn from each Amazing. other. Well, uh, we didn't really manage to get through the list of things it I did. Bound to happen. That for another <laughs> hour and a half, probably. But Cole, thank you so thank much you, for Andy. that really good fantastic. conversation. Uh, I hope you all found that interesting. Again, it's StoryTellingWithData.com to go find out more about the book, uh, about the challenges. And with that, thank you very much for watching and enjoy your day. Bye-bye.